All right, good morning. Am I on? I guess I am. Okay, Tony, hear me all right? Okay, good deal. I want to know why y'all are so quiet. What, what's the deal? Why are y'all so quiet? If you, usually, uh, usually there's all kinds of conversation and fellowship going on and so forth or whatever, and, and I think that's wonderful. And um, Huh? We're ready for you. You think so? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, but, uh, so good. All right. So it's 1128. So we will start two minutes early. Amazing that we start Bible class a couple of minutes early. That's good. Okay. All right. I want to thank Jamie for taking over for me for the last couple of weeks while Trilba and I were gone. Uh, we had a great time with our trips and our vacation or whatever, our time out of town. Um, uh, always good to be home. All right. And great to be back at, um, worship and Bible study um, with everyone. Uh, but I'm, again, I appreciate Jamie taking over for me. Uh, what'd you study, fella? Hebrews. Hebrews. All right. Good deal. All right. Okay. I'm certain. I'm certain. The uh, Okay. We'll go back to Proverbs today. You know, we have uh, been calling this series, as you know, Don't Be Dumb, the wisdom of Proverbs for today. Uh, and we will be talking today. It's kind of interesting, I think. Um, that uh, the lesson I was thinking as Robbie was going through his uh, sermon on spiritual warfare and emphasizing that a part of that we need to depend upon the strength of God, we need the help of God and, and all of that, we need the help of Jesus, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking about as we were going through this that maybe this lesson um, from Proverbs today, don't be dumb about self-control, we'll, where we'll be simply talking about or we'll be talking about self-control maybe it kind of goes along somewhat with this lesson that maybe our responsibility in fighting this spiritual welfare uh, is to develop some self-control. But before we read about some passages from Proverbs that talk about self-control, self-control in a number of areas, I want to open kind of with this story. <clears throat> the book of Nehemiah opens with the title character, that is Nehemiah, receiving some tragic news from his homeland of Judah. Uh, if you'll remember, Nehemiah, along with the other Jews, um, was in exile in what had been the Babylonian Empire, but at that time was now ruled by the Persians under King Artaxerxes. But Nehemiah still had a profound uh, love for his home country and its capital city, Jerusalem. And you read this in Nehemiah 1 and verse 3. Nehemiah 1 and verse 3, where uh, Nehemiah received a message from home, and it distressed him. And this is Nehemiah 1 and verse 3. The remnant, the remnant that was still left in, um, uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame, the verse reads. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Nehemiah heard this news, and it distressed him greatly. As I said, it was very disturbing to him, so disturbing to him that he wept, and he mourned, and he prayed, and he fasted for days until he was finally able to lay his sorrow before the king, King Artaxerxes, and gain permission to return to Jerusalem to lead the way in rebuilding its walls. You might remember that story, uh, the story of Nehemiah leading uh, the re restoration of the walls in Jerusalem. But we might ask, in the rebuilding of the city, but we might ask, why so much conster consternation about a wall? And why was this considered a matter of shame, as we just read in Nehemiah 1 and verse 3? Well, the answer lies in the role that walls played in the defense of ancient cities, and at that time, all ancient cities. Cities were surrounded by great high walls. Remember the story of Jericho and the fall of the Battle of Jericho and the walls fell down? Cities were surrounded by great high walls, sometimes 15 to 20 feet thick, and sometimes there was a double wall just in case the outer wall was breached. In the days before modern warfare, a city's wall was its first and best defense against invasion. When attack seemed imminent, the people in the surrounding villages would hurry inside the city walls and the gates would be shut. They would be securely shut. 
Once that occurred, the city was difficult to overthrow. So the wall of a city was a symbol of security. So what Nehemiah was so upset about, what he was bemoaning, was the fact that Jerusalem, minus its wall, lay as a hopeless victim to any and every enemy who might want to invade it. But, you might ask me this morning, you might reasonably ask, what does this have to do with Proverbs and self-control? Well, let's see if we can find out what it has to do with the walls of this city and Nehemiah being so upset about the walls of the city of Jerusalem being um, torn down or damaged at least anyway. Let's read. Let's start with Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Proverbs 25, 28. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I'm going to try probably in several passages this morning as we read these verses on self-control and as we discuss these things Uh, to probably maybe ask you to read from different translations of Scripture, particularly the English Standard Version has some good renderings of some of these passages we'll be reading um, this morning. But initially I'll be reading from my Bible, which is the New King James Translation. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. And it says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit it's like a city down, a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Um, does anyone have the English Standard Version? Anyone have the English Standard Version? The Bible, your version of the Bible that you might be reading from this morning. Anyone? Brian, would you read that passage from the English Standard Version for me if you would? Okay, all right, kind of makes it plain. Plain. We're talking about self-control this morning, about not being dumb about self-control, about exercising self-control. And we just talked about the walls of the ancient cities and how important that they were. And the English Standard Version, I think, makes it very clear, as Ryan just read to us. A man without self-control is like a city, and I was, uh, by the way, a man or a woman without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls, all right? But tell me, expound on this for me a little bit. Why would the Proverbs say this? Why would the Proverbs say, why is self-control so important? What does self-control do for us? The passage, again, from the English Standard Version, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Why would that be true? We just talked about how important walls were in ancient cities. Uh, the protection they provided, the security they provided. So why would it be true, someone help me here, and um, put in your own words if you would, that a man or woman without control is like a city broken into and left without walls? Why is self-control so important? What does self-control do for us? Excuse me? It's a guard against the evil. I really like that. It's a guard against evil. Okay, very good, Peggy. Thank you. All right, Gary? It protects us from our own self. It protects us from our own self. What you think is usually what you want. Okay, we can dismiss the class right now. Okay? We can go ahead and dismiss and beat all the other church folks to the uh, Texas Roadhouse. All right? Okay? All right, for lunch. Okay? Because that's exactly what self-control does. Uh, in my notes, I'm going to get back to them again. I'm going to have a talk about that exercising self-control is so important to our own well-being. Okay? We're going to say that over and over again this morning. You're probably going to get tired of hearing me say that. That exercising self-control, that having self-control, having self-discipline is so important to our own well-being. I like both of what it was said. Peggy, will you repeat to me again what you just said? Okay, I've already forgotten. Tell me again what you just said about it, Peggy. Tell me again what you just said a moment ago. It's a guard against the evil. It's a guard against evil, and Gary says it protects us from ourselves, all right? Okay? Anybody else? Anybody else want to talk about why self-control or give us some thoughts in your own mind of why self-control is so important. 
Well, maybe those two things sum it up. Uh, you know, uh, the next thing I had written in my notes here, kind of going along with what Peggy just said, according to the proverb we just read, Proverbs 25 and verse 28, our best defense against being overrun by evil of sinning, as Peggy just said, is the wall, if you will. That's why I started talking about Nehemiah and the wall and why he was so upset at the breaking down of the wall of Jerusalem. Against being overrun by evil of sinning is the wall of self-control. That is our best protection. All right? I think that's absolutely true. Don't you think so? Okay? If you think about it, don't you think so? Don't you think? And that's, uh, that's why I said when kind of both, both Peggy and Gary said what they said, that we could kind of almost dismiss. That's what self-control is about. All right? But we probably don't need to quite dismiss yet because we need to talk about how we learn to exercise self-control, uh, self-discipline, how important it is in our lives as Christians, how it's important in our lives, period, okay? But if we take it away, if we take self-control away, we lie as helpless as Jerusalem, if you will, against the onslaught of temptations that come our way every day. Again, I'll ask, don't you think that's true? Yeah. If we take our own self-discipline, our own self-control, now, we need some help on that, and we'll talk about that as we go through our lesson this morning. But again, as we t if we take, about, take away self-control, we kind of lie helpless against the temptations that come our way every day. And they do come our way every day. Do they not? Yes. All right, I think that's part of what Robbie was talking about this morning. Self-control, if you will, gives us the ability to restrain our appetites. And I'm not just talking about our eating appetites, okay? I'm talking about our other appetites, okay? All right? Gives us the ability to restrain our appetites and avoid temptations that can bring us down spiritually and in other ways. Spiritually, most importantly, but in other ways in our life also. When we lack self-control, we're subject to all sorts of difficulties, all sorts of problems. And not only that to the shame and humiliation that goes with these problems, that goes with the lack of exercising self-control, that goes with the lack of exercising self-discipline. And brethren, uh, I, I don't think just, this applies just to the world outside these walls, okay? I think it applies to you and I this morning. I know it's implied through, applied throughout my entire life. I don't know about you, but I know it has. Matter of fact, I was going to ask these questions now. Have you ever watched, you, you know, you don't have to volunteer any information or anything like that. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. I'll just ask you to think about it. Have you ever watched or witnessed someone lose their self-control? I know you have. Some heads are shaking yes, and I have, okay, all right? It's not pretty, is it? No. Uh, well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever watched a Christian lose his or her self-control? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. And that really isn't pretty, no. is it? All right. So let me ask you this question, and I'll be the first one to answer. Have you, me, have you, and I'm asking me, okay, too, have you ever lost your self-control and felt ashamed afterwards? I'll put up both hands, okay? Both hands, all right? Okay? So, as I look across the audience this morning, and I'm going to tell you, I've thought about this as I've taught this lesson of Proverbs, okay? And our audience is kind of mixed this morning. But if I've talked about, as, I, as I've gone through, you know, I, I said how excited I was myself to teach from the book of Proverbs because I never figured out how to do that before I decided to tackle it uh, this time around with Brother Tommy's house book that I've been using. Um, and I thought about it and I looked over the audience that I was addressing. We talked about Proverbs. It's about, you know, it's the wisdom for today, the wisdom of Proverbs today, wisdom of how we live our personal lives. But I kept looking, got to choose my words carefully now as I say this, okay? I kept looking at the audience that I'm teaching this class to, okay? Now, this morning, it's a little bit more, as I look across it, diverse age-wise than some mornings when I've taught it so far, okay? 
that I've said to myself, and again, I'm choosing my words carefully, okay, trying to, that, uh, you know, I uh, am teaching this class to a fairly mature group. That was a safe word, wasn't it? Mature, okay, a fairly mature group, okay. <laughs> the, uh, so we should have already, and we are Christians, and we should have already developed some wisdom, should we not have, okay? And I've thought a couple times, well, uh, although again, and it's a little bit this morning, there are some younger folks in our audience this morning, and there have been some younger folks in our audience, you know, as time's gone on, you know, various ages or whatever. But I thought about a little bit about this, and I said, you know, does this audience really need these lessons from the book of Proverbs? Well, thank you, Joanne. All right, Joanne, it's nodding her head, yes, and Ryan's nodding his head, yes, and I'm going to nod my head, yes, me, okay, all right. Um, by the way, all right, and I, and I do this, and then it costs me not to finish my lesson. I want to show you, read a passage of Scripture that really says that from the book of Proverbs itself. Go back to Proverbs chapter 9. Again, I thought about this a little bit. I want you to see what Proverbs 9 says. It's really interesting about those of us who may consider ourselves, quote, mature Christians because we've been in the faith for so long and all of that, and for me that's 50 years, and for some of y'all it's more than that. Turn to Proverbs 9 as I just try to make my point about this. Proverbs 9, if I can find it, and I sure hope I can find it. All right. Look at Proverbs 9, and let me begin reading with verse 7, which we've already talked about. And I'm going to read 7 through 9, but I want you to pay close attention, brethren, to something that's said here. Very, very close attention. I particularly want those of you who are, quote, mature in the faith and have been in the faith a long time, and that includes me, to pay close attention to this, okay? Beginning with verse 7, but what I really want to emphasize is when we get down to verses 9, to get down to verse 9. Verse 7, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he rebuke, who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. But notice what 8 and then the verse, the rest, and verse 9 says. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be what? Wiser still. Does it not say that or something similar to that in your translation? Keep reading. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. So as I thought about this, instructing a fairly mature audience, and that includes me, okay? Well, brethren, it says we never stop. We never stop maturing. We never stop, I hope, becoming wiser. We never stop becoming more influenced, more instructed, more guided by the Word of God. Is that not what this says? Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. So our learning never stops. You know, that's kind of the point I want to make, at least in that area, okay? Well, our learning to exercise self-control never stops. And, you know, I've told this to classes several times. I've told this to other people when I'm talking to them. I've told this to young people when I'm talking to them. I grew up with a terrible temper. I mean a terrible temper, okay? And I can tell you as a young person what I just said about, you know, lack of self-control bringing shame and humiliation, okay? And I got a lot of nods of the head. Well, I can tell you my lack of controlling my temper as a young man. And this continued into my 30s and even into my 40s. I was getting a little better, but I still had a lot of work to do. And I can tell you, me not exercising self-control as it has to do with my temper, okay? All right? I can think, I can literally stand here right in front of you right now, brother, and think of instances where it brought shame and humiliation to me. And it brought shame and humiliation to me as a Christian, okay? Now, I'm a lot better by the grace of God and his Holy Spirit, and quite frankly, working very hard on it, okay? All right. I don't mean to pat myself on the back, but I have worked hard on it, but it is by, it's not by my hard work, it's by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit that I'm a lot better with it. Still reaches up and bites me every now and then, quite frankly, but I'm a lot better with it than I was. 
But I tell you what, I still need to learn that self-control. And that's just one area of learning self-control, all right? So it applies to all of us as we think about this. And this, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Well, we're going to talk about that. If I didn't waste too much time, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the... It is. You are right. We're going to talk about it in just a few minutes. I'll skip there when I get to my notes, but thank you for bringing up, Peggy, of how little self-control is exercised in our world today. Think about that. How little self-discipline and self-control is exercised in our world today. I think I've got things in my notes about... Uh, road rage and uh, and uh, sexual indulgences. Nobody tries to hardly, in many cases, even control those things anymore. They are now, quote, the new normal, if you will. Uh, in our world today, self-control and self-discipline just is not a very important or very vital thing. But it must be vital to us, brother. It must be, because we're to be different. And we're to set a different example. And Robbie talked this morning. I'm sorry, I'm getting away from my notes, and that'll cause me not to finish this morning. But Robbie talked this morning about, do they see God? He pointed out some names. I like to ask in the area of self-control and self-discipline, do they see God in Frank? Do they see God in Pete? Do they see God in Tim? Do they see God in Ross? All right. It's really important for us to exercise self-control and self-discipline in our lives. Okay? Yes, ma'am, Bertie. Uh, why would you expect anything different outside of the church? Because that is the world. Isn't right. It? And the devil is controlling that. Right. So you shouldn't, you know, anything to happen. So that's why it doesn't surprise me what they do outside gotcha. of the church. I got gotcha. you. But within the church. But we, it shouldn't be here, right? Okay? To the very best of our ability, again, by the grace of God and through his Holy Spirit, it should not be among us. Self-control and self-discipline ought to be important to us. Okay? All right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Carrie. This is very um, I've been struggling with this for a long time and realized that I can't accomplish anything if I respond. And uh, I have to hold back so much. And it just, and then I pray about it, and um, I do feel better about it. Yeah. And, um, it's because when I do respond, it was like, you know, it just, you know, I still haven't accomplished on what I've said to this yeah. person, you know. And uh, and I said, I pray about it, so I got to just stop and think about what I'm saying and stay in control because I'm very outspoken. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it just when you with someone who's not a Christian, yeah, or they call themselves a Christian, right, and then you respond to that person, and then they look at me and say, "Well, you go to church, wouldn't be a Christian." Well, yeah, I can just say that's right. So now I, I've calmed down so much over the month, over the years, and um, but I don't see no improvement in that person. So it's like I'm against the, you know. Well, all we can do is provide the good example yeah, because, yeah, the, that's what I have because the scriptures say that God gives the increase. Yeah. You know, another part of this is we can't control someone else, no, but we can control ourselves, ourselves, okay? And it is our responsibility to control ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it is hard work, okay? Mm -hmm. later, later in my notes, which again, the further I go, I'm probably not going to get to it, is to talk about self-control is hard work. Mm -hmm. It takes effort. It takes diligence, okay? But it can be done. And I mentioned to well-being, okay, a, minute, a few minutes ago. Self-control is so vital to our own well-being that the book of Proverbs has so much to say about it. And we need to get to some of those now, okay? Proverbs 23. We're not going to read from that this morning unless, unless it's at the very end of the lesson. We might read a little bit from it. But Proverbs 23 is an entire chapter which warns against such sins as gluttony, drunkenness, and sexual indulgence. All right? Okay? And again, I've already asked the question, have you ever known someone who lacked self-control in these areas and others, and it was not only sinful but harmful to their well-being? Have you ever witnessed that? I certainly have. Okay? 
So self-control, again, is not just critical to how we live our lives and so forth. It is, and, and, and being obedient to God and his word, as Carrie was just talking about, but it's vital to our own well-being, okay? All right, let's look at some passages. Let's look at some passages that uh, talk about self-control in the book of Proverbs in various areas. And I want you, as we look at these passages, I want you, uh, I want you to answer to me what area, what part of our lives is Proverbs instructing us to exercise self-control. In other words, identify the area of our lives that Proverbs is talking about as we read these passages. First of all, Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 11. Stay alert now, because I'm going to ask you what it's talking about when we read these, okay? Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man, okay? So what area of our lives is uh, this one talking about that we need to exercise self-control on? What area of our life? How would you describe it? Procrastination. Excuse me? Procrastination. Procrastination, okay, all right. Anybody else? What area is it talking about? Gary? Don't be lazy, Don't be lazy. okay. You know... Uh, at the top of, uh, before verse 6 in my Bible, uh, I have a little thing that it's not a part of the scriptures, but it kind of tells me what's coming next. Maybe you have in your Bible too. It says the folly of indolence. You know, I couldn't remember exactly what indolence me uh, meant, so I looked it up. Anybody remember what indolence means? It means laziness. Okay, that's what it means. It means the avoidance of activity or exertion. So this is talking about the folly of indolence. What it's talking about here is our work. Working. And the opposite of working is laziness, providing for ourselves and our family, being industrious. We need in our lives to have the self-control to do that. Let's continue on. Proverbs 10. Um, well, I, like, let's just go over and just uh, emphasize a this a little bit more, this area a little bit more. Go to chapter 10, and this time verses 4 and 5, not what's on the screen. Pro Proverbs chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a wise man. Who, he, he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. There's that shame and humiliation again. It's about him being industrious, about the self-control to being active, to exert our time, to take advantage of our time, to work if we're still working people. Okay, all right, if we're tired, we have other responsibilities. We have things to do in life or whatever. Let's continue on. Go to Proverbs 10 and verse 19. Let's see what this one is talking about. Proverbs 10, 19. It says, remember when we, in our introductory lessons about Proverbs, we talked that a lot of it would, would, would just be one-sentence things? Much of what we're reading this morning is just these one-sentence things, these short, pithy sayings, which is what Proverbs are. Proverbs 10 and verse 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. What's that one talking about, brother? What's that one talking about? A busy body? All right, thank you. Okay, all right. Somebody want to say that another way? Gary, you had your hand up. Learns to be quiet. Not to talk so doggone much. That's what it's talking about. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, this one's caution is to have the self-control not to talk so much. You know? We're going to run out of time. This is one place. Oh, yeah. Ryan, I think this is one where I wanted to do this. I think, maybe. Okay. Would you read the English Standard Version for 10 and 19, if you would? Okay, words are too many. Words is talking about theirs. It's actually it's talking about our talk, no doubt about it. Okay, all right. Let's. You know, um, Carrie, yeah. you were talking about exercising self restraint when you're talking to someone or something like that. And I was talking earlier about the struggle I've had all of my life learning to control my temper, you know, and so forth like that. 
Let me tell you about a passage of scripture that's been very helpful to me, okay? Uh, in that, in that particular area, tremendously helpful to me as the years have gone on. As a matter of fact, this particular verse, when I get in a particular situation where I think I might be stressed, where I think my, something might be happening, and that temper of mine might rear its ugly head again, and I just don't want that to happen anymore. I'm an elder in the Lord's church, and I'm a Christian, period, okay? And I don't want that to happen anymore, okay? Now, by, as I already said, it still happens sometimes, but by the grace of God, not near as often as it used to, okay? All right, so I said, I need to work on this, and I had a passage of Scripture that really helps me, and I will cite this passage of Scripture to myself when I'm in a situation like that. It's James 1 and verse 19. Who knows what James 1 and verse 19 says? Well, I know what it says because it's been so critical to me. All right. There's an early part of the verse, but the latter of the part of the verse says this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Okay? So you might remember that. Okay? When you're in a situation like that, I cannot tell you how many times I've recited that verse to myself. Be, and I recite the verse to myself every morning when I start my day. It's one of uh, seven or eight verses I recite to myself, okay, that I hope are going to guide me through my life that day, okay? And one of them is, Roth, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, okay? Uh, yes, ma'am. Absolutely, and we're going to read a passage of Scripture that says something about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, okay, exactly. Let's go on. I want to try to finish as much of this as I can this morning. Let's read Proverbs 11 and verse 12 and see what area of our lives this one's talking about. Proverbs 11, verse 12. All right, yeah, Proverbs 11 and verse 12. He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace. You can see where a lot of this has to do with our tongue, all right? But maybe a little bit more than our tongue here. He who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his peace, okay? All right? Uh, Ryan, read the ESV on that one for me, if you All right, he who belittles his neighbor. See, that's a little clearer to me than he who is devoid of wisdom despises his neighbor. He who belittles his neighbor. So this one, that's, it's clear what this one is talking about, belittling other people. We need to have self-control that allows us not to belittle other people. Okay? That's not something on a day-to-day -day basis we should be involved in. There are times, there are quite frankly times as an elder when you have to approach someone and maybe you have to rebuke them about something, okay? And there are times when we do have to rebuke people about something, okay? But we need to be very careful how we do it. And we do it in a spirit of love and meekness and humility, considering ourselves lest we also be tempted, the scriptures say. But we do not need to be involved and we need to have the self-control so that we don't belittle other people, okay? All right, couple more. This one's left out on the screen. I forgot to put it up there when I did my, uh, did the uh, uh, PowerPoint here, the slides here. Turn to Proverbs 15, Proverbs 15, and let's read verses one and two. I would guess that some of you are gonna remember at least the first part of this passage here. Proverbs 15, verses one and two. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Okay? So clearly, I, I, I was asking y'all, but clearly to me this says we need to exercise self-control so that we don't speak rashly or unwisely. Carrie, I think you were talking about that. Peggy, I think you were talking about that. Okay, all right. It's gentle. It's gentle yeah, yeah, okay. As a matter of fact, that's what it says, isn't it? A soft answer turns away wrath. Okay, all right. 
Um, you know, and that takes some self-control. And I'm going to submit to you one more time that if we exercise that self-control, it may be better for our own well-being and how we feel about a conversation we just had with somebody, okay? That we walk away from, and then for the next 30 minutes or an hour or three days or six days or two weeks, we worry about how we had that conversation and the way we said it or whatever. And that's not good for our well-being. So again, self-control is about you know, our own well-being, all right? 17 and 14. Let's look at 17 and 14. Someone just mentioned this one. Peggy, you kind of just mentioned this one, okay? All right, 17 and 14. And I said we were going to read a passage that kind of verified what Peggy just said. Chapter 17, verse 14. The beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Okay? What does it mean there? Stop contention before a quarrel starts. Excuse me? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Stop contention before a quarrel starts. In other words, you don't have to be right about something. And you don't have to continue that argument. <laughs> well said, well said. Okay, because, notice why, because the beginning of strife is like releasing water. What happens when you release water? Until you shut it off, it keeps flowing, doesn't it? And the argument keeps going, okay? So we need to exercise self-control so that we don't have contention so that our quarrel doesn't start, okay? All right? Once it starts flowing. Water is one of the most dangerous things. That's why floods are so damaging. That's exactly right. That's exactly what it's saying, I think, okay? Exactly. And so that contention, if you continue that contention, it just makes it like that flood of water, such a quarrel, okay? You know, Peggy said it so I can repeat it. Sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut, okay? All right? <laughs> Gary. Peggy, I heard anybody say, do you know how to shut your mouth? Once or twice, okay. <laughs> Gary. Absolutely. And that's the point of the proverb, is it not? Okay? All right? That you can't stop that flowing water once it gets going. Okay? Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. And, and, and self-discipline is so important and working at it. You know, I've only got about nine minutes left. I want to talk about really how much the scriptures tell us that we have to work at these things, okay? Uh, I've got a couple more. Let's do these real quickly and then try to sum up if we can. 19 and verse 11. 19 and verse 11. Ryan, I'm going to need you on this as soon as I read the New King James, okay? 19 and 11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. What does he, he, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger. What does ESV say, Ryan? All right, the first part of it again, one more time. Good sense. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the discretion of a man, the discipline of a man, the self-control of a man, and of a woman. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, the... Uh, don't take that personally, ladies, but it applies to both sexes, okay? All right, okay, all right. The discretion of a man, the discipline of a man, the self-control of a man makes him slow to anger. The, the good sense. Aren't we talking about wisdom? Are we talking about developing wisdom? Isn't that what Proverbs is about? Okay, all right. By the way, another interesting part of this was how good it is to overlook a sin against us? How good is it to overlook somebody who transgresses against us? It says his glory is to overlook a transgression. That's pretty good teaching too, is it not? That we ought to overlook some transgressions against us, just let them go? All right, all right. A couple more, and then I'll try to conclude. 27 and 2. 27 and 2. All right. Like this one. I really like this one. I like them all. But this one's an interesting one. 27 and 2. 
Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger, not your own lips. All right? What's that one talking about? Huh? Don't toot your own horn, okay? Absolutely, all right? Um, the, um, it's talking about self-promotion and boasting. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, okay? Exercise some self-control. Don't be about boasting about yourself. Don't be about self-promoting yourself, okay? All right? One more, 26 and 20. 26 and 20. Uh, my guess is you might have heard this in somewhere along the way in your time as a Christian. Chapter 26, verse 20. Tell me what this one is about. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no tailbearer, strife ceases. What's that one about? Put it into one word for me. All right. Yes, but somebody said the word, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely, okay. Um, what should we do when we hear a juicy story? And we don't know whether it's true or not? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't repeat it. Uh, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. You know, we need some self-control to not be involved with gossip, okay? To not be involved with this tail bearing. Uh, do we, you know, we already talked about this. Let me go to the end. It's amazing to me how much the scriptures talk about self-control. I only have five minutes. I have two passages of scripture I want to read you outside of Proverbs. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9, if you will. 1 Corinthians 9. And let's read what Paul the Apostle has to say. And again, that's my five-minute warning, so i got to kind of sum up and tell you what I think is so important in this area, in my opinion. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Uh, Brian, I need you again. Read verse 25 for us from the ESV, if you would. All right, thank you. I'm going to stop you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. That's what temperate means. In the New King James, it says, everyone who competes for the prize, an athlete, it says in um, the ESV, exercises self-control. The King James says, the New King James says, is temperate. That's what temperate means. But notice it says it exercises self-control. An athlete in training for a competition works extremely hard and trains himself or herself, okay? Trains their muscles, trains their other areas, trains their win if they're a runner, all of these kind of things. The point is they work at it, okay? Paul is saying here that self-control is something that you attain. I got a slide up here. Let me get to it. Try to make my point. We got to cultivate this idea. We got to practice it. That's what Paul is saying. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, self-control is something you attain. It's a habit you develop. I promise you it is, brother. My habit of getting better with my temper is something I've had to practice, something I've had to work at, something I've had to train myself on, okay? So Paul says here that we must cultivate and practice self-control in all areas of our life, okay? Okay? Paul says that an athlete exercises self-control in all things in order to win a crown that doesn't last. But notice what he goes on to say. We exercise self-control to win an imperishable crown, or some translations say an imperishable wreath, okay? All right? 
But the point is, we got to work at it. You got to cultivate it. You got to practice it. Uh, we're going to run out of time. May I say one more thing? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I believe Trilby's told me that a couple times. All right. One more thought. We're going to run out of time, and I know we have something coming up here, okay? Turn to Galatians chapter 5. I want to point one more thing out about this idea of exercising self control. Um, Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. This is talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and I want you to notice what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what's the next one? Self-control. Okay? And I want to finish with the thought this morning. I don't think it happens, brethren. It happens by the grace of God. It happens by the Holy Spirit working within us. But we have to work with that Holy Spirit. And we have to work with God. And it seems to me that we have to practice this, that we have to cultivate this, that we have to work on it, that we have to attain it. I don't know about you, but it hasn't worked for me in my life unless I've worked very hard at it. And we have to be willing to not make excuses and work very hard at it. That is our responsibility to our God. That is our responsibility to others. That is our responsibility to our brethren. That is our responsibility to those who come in contact with, who need to need, know more about God, about his son Jesus, about his church, and need to have a good representative of those things. We need to cultivate and protect these things in all areas of our life. Thank you for your attention this morning. Hey, everybody, just uh, real quick before you take off, uh, this young man sitting